Yeah. All right. Um, let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll we'll dive in. <clears throat> Father, we are grateful to be your children. Uh, and this morning we want to recognize that we are your children, that we get to speak to you as Father, because your spirit is within us. That the same spirit that enlivened and empowered and resided in your son, Jesus, now through him also resides in us. And Father, we pray that um, that gift that we have received from you through your son uh, would not be received in vain. Uh, that we might honor it. Uh, be grateful for it and live in a manner that demonstrates that we truly have your spirit living within us, that you have taken our dry bones and have breathed new life into them through the power of crucifixion and the resurrection of your son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, okay, so as you might have seen from the title and guess from the prayer, we're talking about the Holy Spirit today. Uh, and the reason for that, or one of the, the reason I want to spend some time thinking about that is it's a central part of what we hear when someone is baptized, right? I mean, think about the words that are spoken over people when they're baptized. What do we always say? How does, how does that go? Um, yeah, baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there's two other things. There it is. Yeah. Well, no, I couldn't hear because everybody was saying, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> For the forgiveness of your sins or remission of your sins and so that you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, and so it's that last line Excellent. that I want us to think about today. What does that mean to receive the gift? What is the gift of the Holy Spirit? Uh, and so I'm curious, just to kind of pull the crowd here a little bit, uh, what have you been taught? about that? What do you remember being taught? Maybe as you were preparing for baptism, or maybe just as you spent time in church, what have you overheard uh, about the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Holy Spirit? What does that mean? For me, uh, the Holy Spirit is just that, a gift, a helper, as Jesus said before he passed away. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and he's been detrimental in my life. For real, just getting up this morning, I live across the street, and the neighborhood is not that good. So I need him when I leave mm. <laughs> to not say the wrong words, not have intrusive thoughts. So yeah, um, yeah, you get it. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, he is. He's not just a spirit; he's an actual person. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? God, yeah. when, I, when I say he is good, he's guided me to the truth, which, of course, is Jesus. Um, you know, flustered just talking about him because that's how he makes me feel. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, I don't know. Yeah, so, I, mean, so I, hear, I hear lots of things, right? So it is this, it's a person, right, which is important. Uh, that, that first part of baptism, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three persons, of the Trinity, um, but then also this this gift, this helper, uh, as we talked about last week in John, right? That last discourse in John is described as an advocate, helper, someone who comes alongside um, and gives you what you need. Not only that, he guides me, right? Yeah. So he's guiding me on my knees, telling me, "Hey, get on your knees when you need to pray about something." Yeah, very detrimental. Yeah. Um, not only that, guides me in the Word again, yeah. the truth. Guys, me and Jesus. Yeah. Um, when I ask for the Holy Spirit to dwell in, in unto me, He actually does that. Mm. Like yeah. it's not just it's not a feeling; it is. Yeah, it's reality. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Good. Other thoughts, David. I read a book once by Gus Nichols. Gus uh, Nichols. Lectures on the Holy Spirit. You might have read this. I got well Nichols and Whiteside. Sound doctrine. I got yeah, Gus Nichols. Nichols. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and. That guy, I used to be a Pentecostal. Okay. Before I became 
I remember the church. So that's a flash. <laughs> <laughs> and, they were, and when they baptized me at the Church of Christ in uh, in Arkansas, yeah. John and Lawrence was what the uh, he's the overseer of that, that congregation at that time. And man, they, that whole church was excited because that. Yes, that was the first Pentecostal that they baptized. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they were shocked. They said, man, we got us a Pentecostal today. <laughs> and they was all up in the air about it. But the way I was taught in the Pentecostal church, I was just confused because mm -hmm. it didn't really allow that to make sense to me about the way they were teaching us. Mm -hmm. I had to kind of be a little hypocritical about saying I had the Holy Spirit and kind of like acting, you know. But yeah. You receive the Holy Ghost, you speak in tongues, so you go all this, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what the world I was saying, they don't either. <laughs> but anyway, they said when you receive the Holy Ghost, you receive it with the gift of speaking in tongues, right? Like the apostles, the other day at Pentecost. But Gus Nichols explained all of that, and I received it, and then the other teaching that got through the Church of Christ. When you receive the Holy Spirit, there's still a lot of confusion about that today. Even with sure. some brethren that's in the church, they still they have under, uh, this, they have a different view of understanding about even receiving the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But like God Nilsko explained it, it's God's seal upon us. Now, how that is done is hard to explain that. How does God seal us with the Holy Spirit of God? Yeah. And we receive that gift after we are baptized, like Peter said in Acts two thirty eight. Yeah. But it's not the 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 regular the okay, that's the regular Christian doesn't receive the baptismal measure that the apostles received on the day of Pentecost, which allowed them to be able to perform all kinds of miracles and different things of healing the sick, which they had to do that. They did those things, raise the dead. Yeah. And a lot of people think that we are able to do those things because it's so many, so many different yeah. things taught about the Holy Spirit, how it works, how does it operate in us. Yeah. And uh, that book, I, I advise everybody to get that book by Gus Nichols. The lectures on not been reading because I don't have enough time to go over all that. Yeah. But it's really good. But God seals us, but how he does that, I can't explain it. Yeah. God's spirit is in us, each one of us. And in uh and uh and uh Paul, I mean uh in Ecclesiastes 12, it says when we when this body dies, the spirit goes back to God. Yeah. And even James said the body without the spirit <clears throat> is dead. Yeah. So we can't even explain that. I can't explain how the spirit keeps us going alive. You know, we're not plugged up to nothing in the wall to give us energy to get up and go every day. How do we do this? How do we yeah. just get up and keep going? You know? But it's God's spirit that's in us yeah. that calls us to live. Yeah. And when that spirit comes out, this is just like a, a car without a motor. Yeah. You take the motor out the car, just a good looking Dude, you got, you got a car. So, <laughs> go ahead. Well no, you, okay, you mentioned several things. I want to right, talk about right. that. Uh one is the seal. Or uh, the word we'll spend a little bit of time unpacking is the word that's used in Ephesians, earnest or the down payment that we receive. Right. Um, and in even talking about a measure of the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. Because uh, I think that's part of the idea in Ephesians is mm -hmm. uh, we get a dose of it. Yeah. But we don't receive the whole thing until the end. Right. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but then also the motor. Right. Right. Uh, we'll spend some time thinking about that too out of 1 Corinthians 15. Let's get to that. Other thoughts? What were you taught about the Holy Spirit or what it meant to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, he's our counselor, which, you know, I was taught for years and I still, it, it's, he's our conscience. He is the one that guides us, just like everyone said, he lives in us. And I think that um, our self will can still overpower him. I mean, you know, we still have ultimate decision making. But he is the one that get, provides the peace to us that no one understands. He's the one um, that that guides our life if we allow him to. Mm -hmm. And he lives in us. Yeah. Yeah. I always heard the interpreter. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big one for me, just because we can't relate to God without the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. That thing about what the, the, the groans. groans. Groans, right? Yeah. 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 I've heard it mentioned that it's the love between the Father and the Son. Yeah, uh, and that it's like this kind of intermediate, and, and that when you receive that, that's your 
taking part in that. And yeah. That's a, like a way to understand the Trinity. Yeah, I, I love that picture of the Trinity. Right? Yeah. That the Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son, and that is what we receive, right? Yeah, exactly. And so we are caught up in that same life that is shared between the Father and the Son through the Holy Spirit. That's good. Um, okay, so I want to share with you... Um, a couple of quotes to get us going. And these are like really, really, really old quotes um, from a guy named Irenaeus, uh, who's a second century Christian writer uh, and thinker. Um, and he wrote these, huge, these books about heresies. Of course, in the early church, there's all kinds of weird ideas floating out there, right? And they're trying to sort through it all. And he's one of the guys that's like, all right, no, here, here's what the truth is. And I'm going to combat all this stuff with scripture, right? Uh, and so that's what he's doing here. Um, and he, he gives some teaching about the gift of the Holy Spirit that I think is really helpful. Um, so we'll start with that first quote, that, that first paragraph. But we do now receive a certain portion of his Holy Spirit, of his Spirit, tending towards perfection. As we receive a portion, and what it does is it sets us on the road, right? We are now directed towards perfection. We're working towards that incrementally. And preparing us for incorruption. What does he mean by incorruption? To not do wrong. The opposite of corruption. Yeah, I was going to say it's like, it's like the opposite of corruption. The opposite of corruption. That's right. That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Uh, well, right, if like righteousness. <laughs> oh, well, okay, so that's connected to it. But there's another idea underneath that. Uh, if something is corruptible, what does that mean? It means you can... It's finite. You can... Yeah. You, you can... can Make it, you can bend it to your whims, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's you can do something to it, yeah, right? shape it. And we'll, we'll it, can, it can be influenced, it can be influenced, yeah, there you go. right. Uh, Absolutely. and so I think what he has in mind here is our, our bodies are corruptible, right? In the same way that the, those strawberries in my refrigerator have a have a termination date, an expiration date. Quick. So do we all. They are corruptible. <laughs> yeah, they're quick. That's right. <laughs> I bought them yesterday and they're already started. Um, I gotta bring them to, I gotta bring them to small group tonight. So we can, we can them. Um, yeah, so they, it's it's decay, right? Subject to decay, corrupt we are corruptible. So the Holy Spirit put, puts us on this road towards incorruption, where we're no longer corruptible. We're no we no longer have an expiration date. Being little by little accustomed to receive and bear God, which is also the, the apostle terms in earnest, right? And this is what we mentioned in Ephesians. That is a part of the honor which has been promised us by God, where he says in the epistle to the Ephesians, in which ye also having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believing in which ye have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. There is an inheritance that we're going to receive, right? Uh, and we get a down payment on it. We get a little taste of it now through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and it is the Holy Spirit itself. Like that is the hope, that is the inheritance. Sharing in the life of God is what we're receiving. That's the good thing, ultimately. And so already we've received through the Holy Spirit a little taste of what that will be. Right. Uh, this earnest, therefore, thus dwelling in us renders us spiritual even now and the mortal is swallowed up by immortality for ye he declares are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of god dwell in you through Romans 8 this however does not take place by a casting away of flesh but by the impartation of the spirit it will render us like unto him and accomplish the will of the father for it shall make man after the image and likeness of god okay so He's got this picture, right, uh, where we receive this gift. It's this little taste of the Holy Spirit. And he says that doesn't mean that the flesh, our bodies are done with or, or, or put away. What it means is we've received something else that our, that our bodies need in order to be incorruptible, right? Because uh, that is ultimately the faith that's been passed down to us. When we look at 1 Corinthians 15, the dead are raised, just like Jesus was raised, in, in the bodily form, right? right? But it's a different kind of life. It's interesting that Jesus is never recognized post-resurrection, right? That, that like, the walk to Emmaus, uh, the disciples, when they first Mary, next week we'll talk about that at Easter, she sees him, who, who does she think he is? 
the garden. Yeah. Right? She could feel like everyone who sees him post resurrection doesn't recognize him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and I think there's something too. I think he's. I think the gospel writers are kind of teasing us that there's something different about life on the other side of resurrection yeah. um, that isn't fully comprehensible to us at first. Um, okay, so that that's kind of the picture that he's painting here. Um, and then if, I've got Ephesians 1, 13, 14. That's, that's uh, the quote that he, uh, he used there. Uh, okay, then there's another one just underneath that, another quote from Irenaeus that I want to share. That is, we try to unpack that idea of receiving the Holy Spirit in this way. At the beginning of our formation in Adam, that breath of life which proceeded from God, having been united to what had been fashioned, animated the man. Okay, so jump down to Genesis 2-7. Oh, you don't have one? I had it. I, it's a miracle. It just disappeared. It disappeared. <laughs> I just kept, I've been looking down. Oh, you didn't mean. I said, it's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so look at that Genesis 2 7. Uh, then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Okay, that verse right there is what he's talking about in that first line. That God created a person, he created Adam out of the dust, but Adam wasn't a living being until what? He breathed. Wow. The, spirit, the breath of life breath of is breathed life. into him. And then he's a living being. Animated the man. And manifested him as a being endowed with reason. There are, you can use your brain. Uh, so he's, he's not just sitting there breathing. He, he's thinking. He has a rational mind. He can make decisions. So also in the times of the end, the word of the Father and the Spirit of God, having been united with the ancient substance of Adam's formation, talking about dirt. This is a fancy way of talking about dirt. Ancient substance of Adam's formation. Dirt. Uh, rendered man living and perfect. Receptive of the perfect Father in order that is in the natural Adam, we all were dead. So in the spiritual, we may all be made alive. Okay, so it's this, this replacement Right? It's like we're replacing the engine on the car. Right, The engine breaks down. It's corruptible. And what do you need? You need a new engine to keep going. Right, yeah. uh, that, That's what he has in mind here. That the Holy Spirit replaces this breath uh, that was given to us originally, the way it was given to Adam. He breathes life into Adam, but it's a life that isn't eternal. Right? Uh, so on the other side of baptism, as we receive the Holy Spirit, it is a new kind of breath that is breathed into us that makes us incorruptible. It's the receiving this gift of eternal life. The living creature. Yeah, the living creature. That right. We're, we're new creatures. Oh, new creatures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No? Remade. No, that's absolutely right. Um, I mean, think about new creation language in Second Corinthians, right? Um, there's new creation. Um, John 20. Okay, so the, this this actually happens in the Gospels, this, this breathing, this new spirit. Uh, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. This is Jesus' first appearance to the disciples. Um, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Same thing that happens with Adam in the beginning. Jesus breathes into them the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that comes with uh, not only this, this gift of eternal life, but also uh, this mission, right? As I was sent, I am sending you. Right. The Spirit comes with this mission. Into, because what is the Spirit's job? What is the Spirit trying to do? To God, leading God. Yeah, and towards what? Redemption. Holiness, redemption. Holiness, for For what? Salvation. Uh, oh, 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 what all is try the Spirit trying to say? What does the Spirit want the to say? The world, right? The world. Yeah. Uh, and so it can't just stay within us as individuals, right? To be empowered by the Spirit, to receive this new Spirit, uh, and get caught up in what the Spirit is doing, of course implies that we would be about that work. If the Spirit is driving us, then we are taking steps, and everything we touch 
suddenly starts to be new creation. That's that yeah. Second Corinthians five idea, right? It's not just that I am a new creation. It's that because I have been made a new creature, everything else becomes new creation too, right? But yeah, yeah through your like actions, through your love, and through your hospitality, you're breathing into others, right? But because that's what though. what's that? You gotta be willing. That's right. Yeah, yeah. we partner with the spirit, willing. right? Yeah. Uh, because this is part of what goes wrong in the very beginning, right? We, when we think about the fall, often we think about that in moral terms, which is fine. We, I mean, we should think about it in those terms, but that means we obscure some of the other stuff going on there. What is Adam's job? He has a job. Adam and Eve have a job. What's their job? Take care of the garden. Take care of the garden, right? God has created something, uh, and without human care, it's going to fall apart. We actually have this vocation, this calling to order the world after God's wishes so that God's will might be done. Well, we screw that up, right? And everything comes down with it. Uh, and so for us to have the spirit within us, for us to be made a new creature, for us to receive that original vocation and actually be able to accomplish it means it's not just good for us. It's good for everything that we have contact with if we're living in line with the spirit. Um. Okay, so and I want to touch again on this, this engine metaphor. First um, Corinthians 15, which that this I, I, I struggled with trying to pick out just a part of First Corinthians 15 because it, the whole thing uh, is, is just so rich. Um, but we're going to focus here on this section from 45 to 49. Thus it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. Okay, there's our language again of Adam. Living being, breathe life. He's a rational human being. The last Adam, what's the last Adam? Who's that? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. The last Adam became a life giving yeah, spirit. Right. That Jesus is that source of life. For us, right. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical and then the spiritual. That's the, the, the last Adam didn't come first. That's all I'm right. saying. Uh, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those are who are of the dust. And is the man, and as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. That is, if you're made of dust, you're going to act like someone who's made of dust. If you're someone who comes from heaven, you're going to act like someone who comes from heaven, right? So that those who are in Jesus Christ, well, we are we are like the one who is made of heavenly things. Uh, rather than the dust of the earth. You know, you, I used to, on this way, said the first Adam and then the last Adam. It took me a long time to to call. I used to argue with people, you know, debate with people all about Jesus Christ is the Son and God is the Father. Jesus Christ. But Jesus is. He's the second Adam. He, the first right. Adam was our Father, so the second Adam was our Father, too. Yeah. So it, it, well, Jesus is our brother. But he's all of it. He's our mother, he's our brother, he's our father, he's our everything. Mm -hmm. So the second Adam is Jesus, and he's our father. Yeah. But so he's not God the Father. Well, I don't care what it is. He's well, it gets, it gets all really, I mean, that's where the Trinity gets so confusing, it right? Is. Because it is one God. It's one God. Yeah. And he says, that we one, two, three, and he has one. It's yeah. one. Yeah. It's confusing. Yeah. But. But it's the same God. It's the same God, right? right? Yeah. The God that is revealed in the second Adam is the God who created the universe, that's right? Like that's that's the thing. Um, because if He wasn't, then we'd still be in trouble. Sure would. Uh, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, it is we are like Adam, right? Right. We we screw things up. We lose our vocation. We sin. We've borne the image of that. We will also bear the image of the man of heaven. We will be like. Yeah. Christ, uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's two words here that are used, physical and spiritual, uh, in the Greek. So it's psychikos, uh, and then pneumaticos. Uh, are there any mechanics in the house? Yeah. Any what, 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 guesses on... Mechanic. Pneumaticos, what that means? Pneumatic, pneumatic, right? It, air. It's, a, it's air, powered by air, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so this this has this idea of being powered by spirit, spirit right? We are pneumatic people, not nomadic, pneumatic. pneumatic. Um, powered by spirit, physical, uh, and 
sometimes when we think about these two words, we get really kind of dualistic in our thinking. The physical is the stuff we can touch, right? And the spiritual is the stuff that we can't really see. Um, I think there's more overlap here. And I think what, what uh, Paul is getting at in 1 Corinthians has to do with our engine metaphor. What is empowering us? Um, and it's kind of like the difference between a sailboat and a nuclear warship, right? Both are boats. Both go on the water, but the way in which they move on the water is completely different, right? There is a different kind of power here uh, than we have here. This is the breath of life. Uh, but this is the very Spirit of God enlivening us and giving us the things that only the Spirit of God, who himself is incorruptible, who doesn't have death within him, we're sharing in God's nature here. God is sharing his nature with us. Uh, that what, what is of God now becomes of us. That's, that, I think that, that's what he's saying in that last line. Right. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we also bear the image of the man of heaven. We we're empowered by Earth, the Spirit. Earth, dust, and stardust. That's right. <laughs> uh, we become like God. Um, okay. Which means uh, we have a different relationship with death on the other side of this. Right? So if you flip your pages over, um, I want to think about some of the implications. If this is true. If this is the gift of the Holy Spirit, that we have the very Spirit of God inching us towards incorruptibility, towards eternal life, um, what does that mean for us in our, in our moral lives? Uh, and I, th I think the key verse here is, is Hebrews 2. Uh, there, since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things. Jesus became like us. Right. So that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. Okay, so uh, how many of you have seen the movie Men in Black? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So there's that last scene uh, where the bug alien guy eats, uh, oh, what's his name? Tommy Lee Jones, right? And then what happens after that? He blows him up, right? From the inside. Yeah. But he thinks he's one, right? The bug creature he thinks he's one. I've just eaten my opponent. There's nothing he can do now. Uh, but then he hears a little... Yeah. <laughs> the going on. Boom, right? Okay, that is a perfect image of what happens in the resurrection, right? Just think about that the next time on Easter. That's what I want you to think about. The bugs exploding. Yeah. Um, giant cockroaches, right? That's the stuff of Easter. Uh, <laughs> because that's that's the image. Or like when Neo goes into Agent Smith and then explodes. That's out. another one. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I've watched that movie many times. I don't. I'm not seeing. The <laughs> 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 that correlation is. Call it an old guy thing. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to watch some older movies. <laughs> Uh, although it's making me feel old, because my, I'll try to watch like Men in Black or The Matrix with my kids. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> um, I'll watch it. <laughs> that's right. But okay, okay, so that's that's the image though, where death and Satan, who has power over death, thinks he's won. Right? He has just destroyed Jesus. Uh, but then Jesus blows the bug apart. Right? He comes out of the grave, conquering death. Right? Death didn't have power over him. He didn't stay in the tomb. Uh, Jonah is a perfect image too, right? Yeah, in the belly of the fish, gets spit up, right? And there is new life on the other side of that. Uh, okay, so that's that's what he's talking about here in, in Hebrews. That death might be destroyed, and the one who has power over death might be destroyed because of what Christ has done. And then, here's the key twist. And free those who who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. All right. All right, so we've talked about slavery before in this class as a metaphor for what happens in baptism, right? Especially if we take Exodus as like our, one of our central texts for understanding what baptism is. It is freedom from sin and death that allows us to enter into the promised land, cross the Red Sea, 
Pharaoh's minions are drowned in the Red Sea and they no longer have any power over us and we get to live, live a whole new life uh, and receive uh, the law, this new spiritual law at Mount Sinai, right? Like that's the picture of what happens at baptism. Okay, so that's, that's the picture again that's being painted here. We have been free because of what Christ has done and because the Spirit allows us to share in what Christ has done, that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead raised us as well, raises us as well. We get to share in that. Death, we have a very different relationship with death then, right? right. Uh, and so I've got two options here, right under that Hebrews passage, that correspond to the way we typically think about this. Uh, one way to think about what happens in the garden uh, is that sin leads to death, right. right? That's typically the way we talk about it. Uh, and I mean, there's truth in that, right? right. Sin does lead to death. Uh, but what's happening here in Hebrews is, okay, the opposite is also true. The death also leads to sin. That as, and the, especially the fear of death leads to sin. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, gosh, we're going to talk about this today in the sermon. We're talking about Pilate, Pontius Pilate. Why does he do what he does to Jesus? Well, there's a threat in front of him, right? That leads him to make a decision that he might not otherwise if he wasn't scared of dying. Um, even if it's a small kind of death, like a, the destruction of his political career. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so read this next line. This is another old Christian thinker. He who fears death is a slave and subjects himself to everything in order to avoid dying. But he who does not fear death is outside the tyranny of the devil. Oh, gosh, I love that one. Those who do not fear death are outside the tyranny of the devil. The devil has nothing on you if you're not afraid of death. Right? If we truly believe what Paul talks about in Romans 6, we have already died. That's it. Right? We've already shared, we've already been buried with Christ. Then there's nothing else that death can do to us. And that's a whole new kind of courage. I mean, there's just all these uh, wonderful stories from the very early church that are so convicting to me. These, these stories of like pregnant moms that are like being held captive. They wait until they give birth and then they're thrown into gladiator games. And it's all because they wouldn't swear loyalty to the emperor, right? Because they felt like that would be denying their faith. Um, they wouldn't burn incense to the God, the emperor. Um, and they were willing to do that. Why? I've already died. Right? I, I'm, I'm already going to die anyway. It's going to happen one way or another. And so I'm not going to to reject the thing that is actually saving me, right? right. I, wa I want to be a spirit-empowered person. And so I'm going to stay in line with this no matter what it costs me physically mm -hmm. because I know ultimately this is what is saving me. Um, if we do not fear death, Satan cannot touch us. Uh, for indeed, man would give skin for skin and all things for the sake of his life. Job 2.4. And if a man should decide to disregard this, whose slave is he then? He fears no one, is in terror of no one, is higher than everyone, and is freer than everyone. There, uh, how many, right, here, maybe this one will hit you. Hit you. Band of <laughs> Brothers? Band of Brothers. <laughs> okay, there we go. There's a scene in that movie where there's one of the soldiers is terrified. He's just like, he can't do anything. He's caught, like um, just hiding in the foxhole the whole time. Uh, and another soldier comes up to him and says, look, you've got to decide you're already dead, right? Like, you, that's that's the outcome. You just have got to know you're not making it alive out of this war. Uh, that's the mentality you've got to have in order to have, do anything courageous. Um, and I think there's truth in that that's being echoed here, too. You have to decide you're already dead in order for you to have the kind of courage that is required to live the kinds of lives we're being invited into. Um for he who disregards his own life disregards more, so all other things. That is, if our life doesn't matter to us, if we're willing to give that up, we're willing to give up anything. That's it. And when the devil finds such a soul, he can accomplish in it none of his works. Tell me, what can he threaten? The loss of money or honor? Why would I be afraid of losing money or honor, people's, my reputation, if I'm already not afraid of dying? Or exile from one's own country, for these are small things to him. Who counteth not even his life dear, says Paul in Acts 20. Right. Okay, so that 
that changes uh, this this spirit empowerment changes the way we live our lives if we know that what this means is we've already received a dose of eternity that we already have we're already on the road to eternity we're already being made incorruptible uh, and if we stay on that path that's where it leads it leads us finally to the life of god who is eternal we get to share in that um, which makes sense of things that we hear in Galatians 5, right? When we think about the Holy Spirit, that's another one of those critical places that we think about. The fruits of the Spirit, right? Uh, how much time we got? It's a few minutes. Yes. Well, you know, in the, you can't make in the garden. Is this good when I got to go greet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all, y'all it out. Just get good. I got to go. <laughs> Stop it, <laughs> Adam and Eve didn't, there was no differentiate between good and evil. There was no evil. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> when they when they partook of, of the fruit, which was the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they became corruptible. Right. <clears throat> to me, the Holy Spirit is a gift from God <clears throat> to for us to use to differentiate between good and evil and set a different direction in our life. And through that, we are able to gain back what Adam and Eve had in the first place. Right, right. And that was... Uh, eternal life basically right. right but the holy spirit allows us to differentiate between good and evil yeah. and to set a different direction in right. our life or right. set a different purpose right and and that's part of right the language of being a guide teacher right we need the spirit to guide us in those things to let us know right, this is the direction we want to go that's not the direction we want to go uh and even beyond that to empower us to be able to make good decisions, right? Because think about what, what Paul says in Romans 7, the thing I want to do, I don't do, the thing I don't want to do, I do, right? It's the spirit that disrupts that kind of living. How? Well, I, I think it's through this lack of fear of death, right? The spirit empowers us by letting us know, oh, gosh, we, we already have the spirit of God. We are already belong to the eternal one, to the one from heaven, Um which lets us live the kind of life that is talked about in Galatians 5, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love. This is verse 22, so I'm jumping down since we're running out of time. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And then listen to this. This is the key verse that we, we often just skip over. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. If the Spirit already resides in us, if it's the thing now empowering us and breathing life into us, then let's also live a life that, that matches the life we've received. The, the moral decisions we make ought to be in line with someone who knows we are on the path to incorruption. Yeah. Because we can't quench the Spirit. Mm, yeah. We can't limit it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to continue to make choices as if, well, we've got to protect ourselves. Uh, you know, the, the thing that there, there are things that could hurt us that we're fearful of, and every time we face one of those things, uh, we get tempted to come back, come back this direction, to be powered just by the breath of life rather than the Spirit of God. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, you know, I was just saying, when I talk about the Holy Spirit, I think about it in John 17, 16, 17, where Jesus told him he was going to wait on the Spirit, send the Holy Spirit, and he was going to guide him. I think that's the same way he does through us, but we get it through through his word. Yeah. 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 The Spirit, we receive yeah. the Spirit of Christ through the Word, right. the Word of God. Yeah. All right. Well, we were a matter of time. Uh, this is the last class, so uh, you teach it sure, again? I'm sure. I, yeah, I'll be around. <laughs> I'll put you on the spot. Okay. Uh, thanks for being here, guys. Appreciate y'all. Uh, let's go worship. <laughs>